Chapter 1. Criminally Insane and Senseless. The study of characteristics of criminally insanest helps profilers enter the minds of killers and predators. To figure out what could happen next, within the plots and schemes of ruthless acts, and the new possibilities continue to shock researchers. Often the term criminally insane gets assigned to people whose crimes stem from psychosis, the inability to distinguish what is imaginary from reality. While those senseless individuals' legal defense involves a psychological disadvantage in conforming to the laws of the land, they are often labeled a monster or villain. Monsters are frightening, cruel, rude, ugly, and wicked. And a villain is someone whose evil actions or motives are a part of a plot or scheme. Both senseless characters mask their intentions or put on the mask of sanity, lying as a way of life. They intensify their desire, entitlement, or ownership, either murdering, sexually assaulting, or taking possessions and then making a fast getaway. Their certain qualities reveal conduct that justifies lawlessness, dismissing and ignoring the victim's concerns and feelings with selfishness. While their attitude lacks sacrificial elements culturally and civil, they often unrelentingly prevail against the justice system. There are three senseless types such as aggressive, impulsive, and some of which be antisocial. Towards the end of 2013, there were an estimated 1.5 million prisoners in the U.S. The number of prisoners age 55 and over had increased in three decades from 8.853 to 144,500 by 2013, and this trend is expected to reach 400,000 by 2030. This term of a prisoner is a person confined and kept in the state's prison for criminal acts. Initially, we are taught how and when to avoid the criminally insane. Literally by not making a rushed decision of trusting people's first impression. Trusting your instinct when a person asks you to do things contrary to your beliefs. Storing your treasures up away from thieves, securing valuables, and not leaving money out. However, if we did all those things daily, we would too develop mental disorders because there is a very thin line between criminally insane and senselessness. Many senseless people just want to often feel admirable, desirable, or heroic to others. Which is to appear high-minded if you are incapable of naturally asserting those feelings. According to mental health, overly authoritative parents contribute to some elements of mental disorders, while genetics and the environment contribute to all other elements. Although many people fully believe two young men of the same age who commit the same crimes and coming from very different backgrounds, homicidal actions cannot be attributed to parenting styles. For the most part, psychiatrists are trained to find the problem in their patients, but when being diagnosed with having a mental disorder, the interview is about evaluation and will not include your environment or parents. It would include meds and treatment eventually. The cultural and civil identity of the senseless, illiterate, and insane are replaced with aggression and fear for other victims. An obvious reason why there are more criminals these days, starting from birth to adult ages, people just aren't utilizing individuality or personality effectively. Which results in illiteracy, misunderstood personality, a stolen identity, and even a lack of finding a purpose in life. But at one time or another, we all have admired being told others' core values, individuality-supported experiences, or intellectual experiences some of which avoided looking within oneself, to find their purpose in life. Since they didn't plan on being admirable, desirable, or heroic, they played down assertion for lawlessness. These are the first signs of senselessness, to be foolish or simple-minded. Most senseless people be angry and hostile toward others for a grief or trouble that someone else bestowed upon them. Such as one or both parents being absent from their life, and as a result, they may have had important things taken away, been abused, or taken advantage of. Any of this can appear as a plot or scheme that was planned against the individual, especially if this helps lead them to the aggressive, antisocial, or impulsive personality disorder. The grief or trouble is often what triggers them to commit crimes or plot against innocent people. Senseless people are acting upon unnatural impulses, and contributing to their irrational thoughts. And actually, forgetting about core values, and why there is a need to live civilized. They rather give in to irrational concepts than face fears of distressful crisis, when in fact they're avoiding making significant choices. Sure, they probably want to appear high-minded and relevant while being a dictator who believes by any means is how you achieve fame, fortune, and drive fancy pimped-up cars. When in fact, this describes the state of euphoria. Someone who uses temporary happiness to hide enviousness, impatience, and insecurity. After becoming a criminal, anger management or alcohol and drug rehabilitation are often recommended. Anger consists of strong feelings or displeasure formed through wrath or wrong did. Rehabilitation is the process of restoring an object or person to an earlier constructive condition or state, essentially the person regains functions that were lost in time. However, programs such as anger management and rehabilitation aren't set up for illiteracy, misunderstood personality, or finding a purpose in life. Otherwise, criminals wouldn't become repeat offenders. When you avoid or cannot stand for something, you will stand for anything. In 1992 my brother Tyrone worked for a local restaurant, and he only worked there for three or four months. He never showed up on time, 
and so the manager would go pick him up for work. Often he couldn't find his brother, and eventually, the manager got tired of looking for him, and then he fired him. As a result of having to pick him up for work, the manager avoided giving him his last paycheck. And so brother conspired with three other guys to rob the restaurant, one of them had worked for the same restaurant. There were four people killed in the robbery, and the manager was one of the victims. Two guys got a lesser sentence, Tyrone got four life sentences, and the gunman was sentenced to death. The manager's sister and I attended a local church ten years later, and she had missed her brother. His sister often wondered why brother Tyrone never bothered to show remorse. For the victims who suffered at the hands of two others, all while he sat in the getaway car. If he had admitted the wrong on his behalf, he could have received a lesser sentence. When I wrote to ask him why he appeared angry in his writings and changed the focus. Probably because our father was mentally and physically abusive, and he never admitted fault nor showed remorse while we were growing up. Brother would often try to tell others about the abuse, and dad would then be more abusive to silence him. The feelings of being silenced are associated with an antisocial personality disorder. Now I believe my brother was yet too traumatized to discuss issues that are related to his experiences. Dad was cold-hearted or felt like damaged goods, in which the feelings of impairment are associated. Often, the person whose evil actions or motives were a part of the plot or scheme dismisses and ignores the victim's concerns and feelings with selfishness. Our mother suffered many years of mental illness before passing away. As a result of her mental illness, my brother and I experienced traumatic events that rocked the core of our relationships. A few of the same types of events that both dad and mom had experienced when they were growing up. And generally, I would rather tell my story than remain in that old trial test story. An antisocial personality disorder is a syndrome, it is also called psychopathy or sociopathy and is especially found among convicted criminals. Of which a person cannot discern right from wrong, and may behave violently. There are some senseless types, who know right from wrong, and just rather be dogmatic and relevant while violating the laws and rights of others. In this case, the term mental illness won't necessarily justify their actions. Cognitive neuroscientists have been trying for years to determine the link between brain abnormalities and criminal behavior. Neuroscience suggests that certain criminals' brains are different from those individuals without any mental disorders. Either criminals' brains are anatomically or functionally different, the parts that manage or mediate impulses can have an imbalance. The drive to act impulsively is inhibited by the prefrontal cortex. Some neuroscientists and psychiatrists are challenging the idea that behavior is a product of free will, and whether or not a person can decide to be a criminal. Alcohol abuse and other injuries to the prefrontal cortex can cause disinhibition of the no-go paradigm. While other illnesses, as well as illicit drug use, can hijack the go system and make it hard to curtail a particular behavior. In addition, several neurological syndromes affect the ability to change and monitor our behavior, initiate or stop actions, and understand the consequence or outcome of actions. Some studies showed that average antisocial people had a volume reduction of two sections in the brain's frontal lobe, 18% in the middle gyrus and 9% in the orbital gyrus. Other studies showed the amygdala in another part of the brain, 18% volume reduction, thinning deformation in the outer layer of the cortex. In general, the amygdala is the seat of emotion. This is what makes the average people with server antisocial personality disorder appear psychopathic. Whereas they lack empathy, guilt, and remorse. The male brain has a killer gene, making their ability to deal with stressful situations impaired. This is why males generally have higher criminal and violent rates of incarceration. Studies too have shown that the differences in brain volume aren't fixed and are capable of change, just as criminal behavior. Antisocial is contrary to the laws and customs of society, devoid of or antagonistic to sociable instincts or practices. It means a person who is not sociable, not wanting the company of others. Deaths by firearm. The US CDC reported 28,874 gun deaths for 1999, a rate of 10.3 per 100,000 population this included suicides. The number of death firearm homicides in 1999 was 10,828, a rate of 3.8 per 100,000 population. The number of deaths by suicides in 1999 was 16,599, a rate of 6.0 per 100,000 population. The CDC reported 38,658 gun deaths for 2016, a rate of 11.8 per 100,000 population, and this included suicides. The number of deaths by firearm homicides in 2016 was 14,415 a rate of 4.5 per 100,000 population. The number of deaths by suicide in 2016 was 22,938 a rate of 6.8 per 100, 000 population. The CDC reported 39,773 gun deaths for 2017 a rate of 12.0 per 100,000 population and this included suicides. The number of deaths by firearm homicides in 2017 was 14,542 a rate of 4.5 per 100,000 population. 
the number of suicides in 2017 was 23,854 a rate of 6.9 per population. Serial killings. According to statistics of 2014, there were 3,873 serial killers and 11,187 victims of those serial killers. As of 2015, there were 4,068 serial killers and 11,680 victims of those serial killers. As of 2016, there were 4,743 serial killers and 13,105 victims of those serial killers. During the 1970s and 1980s, serial killers were intelligent white males that roamed around the U.S., and they were considered sexual predators. The population of serial killers has changed since then, but generally, they are men. The U.S. has an estimated 2,000 more killers than other countries. Serial killers' methods are the use of firearms or strangulation, 48% of serial killers kill for enjoyment, most kill more than five times, and they kill for financial gains instead of killing out of anger.